Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the SVC speaker series for November. We have a very interesting talk today titled Using Strong Innovation to Develop Profitable Businesses. Perfect topic here at Stevens since we are the Innovation University. I'm pleased to introduce Len Heflick, our speaker today. Len is a graduate of Stevens with a master's in management science, which led him to a stellar career in the baking and food safety industries. Len is president of the board of directors of the Center for Food Integrity, a food safety consultant, and member of the Trace Gaines Advisory Council. He is a visionary leader in the global food industry, focusing on risk management, business assessment, development of strategic capabilities, and practical compliance. Aside from his expertise in food safety and the Food Safety Modernization Act compliance, Len excels in leadership coaching, risk assessment and management, and strong innovation. Len's going to share with us best practices on how to use strong innovation rather than weak innovation to develop persistent and successful products, services, systems, and businesses. Please join me in welcoming Len to Stevens. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for that very kind introduction. It's an honor to be back at Stevens after all these years. As Adrian told you, I've had a 42-year uh, career in food safety and food science uh, in the baking industry and others. Uh, and it's great to be back at Stevens. Uh, I learned a lot when I was here, and I applied a lot of what I learned uh, during my career. So it's been a lot of fun. I've been retired now for a little bit over a year, and I'm still applying it. Just talking about baking bread, I break, bake bread at home almost every day. Uh, still doing experimental designs, trying to figure out uh, best ways to do that. So in addition to my career, I've been a student of leadership and innovation. And those two factors are critical to the success of any organization or company. So we're going to talk about the importance of innovation and how to use it as a strategic tool, as a tr strategic capability in our companies and in our, our careers. So we're going to talk about innovation, what it is, we're going to define some different levels to help us understand differences in technique. We're going to talk about how to perform a strong innovation as opposed to weak. And I'll give you some examples. Innovation at its very simplest is change. Well, change by itself is not very good or not very successful. As they say, different is not always better, but better is always different. So if we're going to improve, we're going to make an improvement or innovate, we have to make change. But it has to be a directed change, a purposeful change, not random, not relying on luck and serendipity. Those are factors, I admit. Uh, a lot of times we are lucky and we take that, that's great. But we can't count on luck and we can't count on serendipity to make us successful. That's not going to work for us. In the food industry, I've watched over the past 40 years as the capability to innovate has diminished. Meaning companies no longer do the kind of research, basic, even applied, that they used to do 40 years ago when I started in those industries. Why is that? There's lots of reasons, but innovation and change are risky, meaning failure can happen. They cost money, and the return on investment may not be within the three-year or five-year window that the management is looking for. I've had upper management tell me, I'm not interested in a project that has a 10-year payback. I'll be retired by then. Well, that's a very short-sighted view and we can criticize it. However, it's real. That is often the way upper management is thinking. So the result was, and has been, that companies don't do a lot of real research and innovation anymore in the food industry, okay? That's not true in electronics and, and other industries. But in food, it certainly is a fact. Uh, and what happens now is the industry will relies to a great extent on their vendors for innovation and new technology. Well, that sounds good, and it works because it reduces cost, it reduces time to, in, uh, to implement a, a new uh, innovation. 
So those are good things. That's, that's what management is looking for. However, the problem is every company has access to the same new technologies, plus they're using the same vendors. So now I tell my upper management, you're asking me to compete and you've got both of my hands tied behind my back. That's not a way to compete. We need to be free and, and, uh, and, and, and able to innovate as we need to. So why do we want to innovate? Well, we want to innovate for change, certainly, but we want to change something that's important, like consumer expectations, customer re requirements. You think it's easy selling product to Walmart or Target or BJ's? It's not. They are very demanding and their demands keep changing because they have to compete. And let me tell you, Walmart especially today is in a, is in a fight for its life with uh, Amazon. We have competition, they're changing also. Uh, we need to change at least as fast as our competition or we're going to be left behind. And believe me, catching up is not fun. You wanna keep up or keep ahead. You never wanna be behind. Regulations keep changing. We need to comply with those regulations and companies that can do so in the most efficient manner possible have a competitive advantage. That's important to recognize. And cost. Costs are continuously going up and in many cases you cannot pass them on to the customer or to the consumer. I had a meeting uh, yesterday with uh, one of uh, the bakeries that I advise and he was complaining about the fact that certain ingredients are going up in price. So they go to Walmart and say, well, we have to take a, uh, a two cent per loaf increase because we have these cost increases that are coming to us from our vendors. And Walmart said, that's a great idea. Maybe you can do that someplace else because you're not doing it here. So they have to find a way to eat that two cents. And two cents in baking in this industry, believe me, is a lot of money. It's a penny industry. So two pennies is a lot. So what are our objectives? And there are many. We want purposeful change. That's the most important thing to recognize is that we're not just changing to change something. We wanna add value to our products or our services. That means cost, it means features, it means function, it means consumer satisfaction or status. Take a look at what uh, companies like Swatch, so most of you are probably too young to remember watches when you had to wind them. Well, they were a pain in the neck because you'd either overwind them or forget you wound them and wind them again and then you'd break the spring. When electronic watches came out, digital, it was a great innovation and the consumers embraced it worldwide to the unfortunate demise of companies in Switzerland where most watches used to be made because no one wanted a wind-up watch anymore. Well, companies like Swatch, Swiss Watch, have done a great job of building back a company by changing the technology so there are, the, the watches have the same kind of benefits that an old wind-up watch used to have, but they have a motor in them. So they're electric, they're great. And they have some cachet and they have a benefit that the Chinese watches cannot match or the Japanese watches cannot match. They're made in Switzerland. And if you wanna pay extra for a watch made in Switzerland, you can do it. We also wanna use innovation to make our products difficult to copy. We don't want our competition to make it, to reverse engineer it easily. So how do you do that? Well, one way is you develop new technology that they don't have. You protect that new technology with a patent or as a trade secret. You develop multiple levels of technology, multiple levels of change. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And you keep innovating to stay ahead. Meaning once you reach an innovation and you implement it, you should already be thinking and working on the next level. Don't wait, immediately start again. You know, Darwin says that uh, uh, it's not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the ones that can adapt. Well, adaptation is, is very important, but we don't want evolution. We want revolution. Okay, evolution is nice, unless you're a dinosaur, then it's a problem. So you don't wanna be a dinosaur. 
So think of General Motors back in 1995 or 1996 when two uh, very nimble and smart mammals named Toyota and Datsun took their business away literally overnight and almost forced that company out of business. Uh, they've done a pretty good job over the last 20 years of reinventing themselves, uh, but they had to change the company and their strategy significantly to do that. So we don't want evolution, we want revolution. So what can we innovate? Well, pretty much anything and everything can be innovated. And if you're going to have a successful company or a successful organization, you need to innovate just about everything you do. So don't limit it just to new products. So I've made a list of companies here, and, and these are companies who have developed strategic capability in specific areas. You can love or you can hate these companies, but the fact of the matter is these guys have built a technological moat around their business that protects it from their competition. And creating a moat is exactly what we want to do. We want to use innovation strong innovation to create a moat. We want to dig the moat deep. We want to dig it wide. We want to fill it with alligators and piranha and boiling oil and any other thing you can think of. But as many barriers as you can create to keep your competition away and behind is what you want to do. And that's the whole purpose of a strategic capability. It's a capability that others are going to have a very hard time duplicating. So you want to think about products and services? Think about Apple, look what they've done. Or business models? Look at McDonald's, and we're going to talk more about McDonald's. Uh, the innovation process itself, so, so meta-innovation. Think of 3M company. People development, look at what GE has done in the last 30 years. Product delivery systems, Frito-Lay. Their DSD, door, store, door delivery system is the best in the industry and probably the best in the world. Very efficient. Uh, density of products that are delivered to the shelf makes a big difference in cost because the cost of delivering 10 units versus 100 units to the same store, the cost is the same. But the cost per unit goes down by a factor of 10. The company I worked for, Bimbo Bakeries, this is one of their strategic capabilities. Very high density. Brand and marketing, trusted brands, great brands that people know and love, think of Nestle. Manufacturing low cost, that means volume, complexity, new technologies, automation, think of Toyota. Product quality, equal to or better than the competition, think of Toyota again. The price on the retail shelf, you know, great value, proportional to the value delivered, think of BIC. All right, cheap products, but they're great products and they work. Uh, great systems, integrated systems, effective, efficient, up-to-date, that support the operations and distribution. Think of Walmart. Walmart has a great system in place and they're going to continue improving it. They announced uh, about six months ago they're going to spend $10 billion with a B on their infrastructure over the next 10 years. It's a huge investment. Supply chain that's efficient. Minimal carrying cost, flexible, responsive, capable, that means quality, uh, safe and innovative. Think of Procter & Gamble, and we're going to talk more about P&G in a minute. So McDonald's, well, you can love McDonald's or you can hate them. However, they have an awesome business model. Ray Kroc, back in 1956, when he invented McDonald's, he bought it from uh, two brothers whose name were McDonald's. Uh, the business model that he created around that business is absolutely genius. It works just as well today, 60, over 60 years later. And by the way, it works just as well in Asia and in Europe as it does in the U.S. It is an absolutely amazing model. You get a chance sometime, go to Wikipedia and read about it. You'll be amazed. The other thing people don't know about McDonald's is their primary business is real estate. They make more money on real estate than they do by selling hamburgers. In fact, they are one of the biggest real estate developers in the world. Their second biggest business is toys. They are the biggest toy distributor in the world, McDonald's. And the third business that they have, oh yeah, they make hamburgers. That's number three, believe it or not. Anyway, what McDonald's has built into their model 
they have a very special relationship with their franchisees. You cannot become a McDonald's franchisee unless they approve it. So if they don't think you're gonna make it, you won't get to buy the McDonald's franchise. And then once you do buy it and you get in, they will do everything possible to make sure you are successful. They will not allow you to fail. It's an amazing system, very powerful. They also have a very special relationship with their vendors. And, and by the way, these are strategic advantages that other companies don't have, okay? Burger King doesn't have this, okay? In fact, they don't even know how to do it. McDonald's does. They have a fantastic relationship with their vendors. Again, they select their vendors by hand. Once you become a vendor for McDonald's, you basically have to do everything McDonald's asks you to do in terms of quality, very stringent, in terms of delivery, on-time delivery, fantastic system. It works beautifully. However, the good part is if you are a McDonald's vendor, they will guarantee that you are successful. You will not lose money, meaning they will check your books and see how much it cost you. If your costs went up, you get a cost increase. They'll also push you and work with you to reduce your cost by automation or other ways. Okay, they're very good business people, but the fact of the matter is they don't let their, their vendors fail. They have a special relationship with their employees. They have one of the greatest training programs in the world. Hamburger U was one of the first of its kind in any industry, teaching people how to make hamburgers. They're not making rocket ships or cars, they're making hamburgers, but they have a university teaching people how to do that. Pretty amazing. And there's a lot of advancement opportunities. So those all contribute to, uh, to making them successful. Those are all innovations that they've created. And there's a couple of others. Great product design, consistency, you know what you're gonna get. You may not like it, but that's what it is. Uh, speed, clean bathrooms, convenient meeting place, brand symbols and slogans are very powerful. Uh, philanthropy and community service, also very powerful. And profitability. I put that last. A lot of people think profitability is number one. Well, profitability is the result of doing all these good things. I tell people that your vision should never be to make money. Your vision should be, really, is, should be to be really good at what you want to do. And if you're really good at what you want to do, you will make money. McDonald's makes 35% profit in the US. There is nobody in the food industry who even comes close. 10% is stellar, 5% is normal. 35 is absolutely unheard of and they've been doing it consistently for 60 years and more. And by the way, Europe and Asia perform at roughly the same level. It's an amazing system they've built. Let's talk about Procter & Gamble. Another great business, great company. Been around a long time. They are known for great products and great marketing. They have world-class R&D, world-class manufacturing, and world-class marketing. But the real innovation, the one that sets them totally apart from all their competitors, is their supply chain. They have a fully integrated supply chain all the way from their vendors all the way to the store shelf. So here's how it works. Somebody goes to a Walmart, and Walmart, by the way, is their biggest customer, and vice versa. P&G is the biggest supplier to Walmart. Somebody buys a box of Tide detergent <clears throat> at a Walmart. Those are tallied up at the end of the day. That information not only goes to P&G, it goes to the vendor who produces the ingredients that are used to make Tide. They know how many boxes of Tide sold today in the US. They know how much ingredient they need to ship to the P&G factory tomorrow so that the factory can replace it. That's how just in time that system is. There's no inventory anywhere. It literally is just in time from the beginning all the way to the shelf. Nobody has anything even close to it. In fact, it allowed them for a 15 year period until 2008 when the financial world blew up, uh, they were able to deliver product to Walmart without any price increases, even though 
they had many price increases on labor, utilities, uh, taxes, and so on. Uh, they were able to eat all those cost increases and not pass any on to Walmart. So you wonder why does Walmart love P&G? And uh, I don't know how any of you remember the detergent called Whisk. There was a very famous commercial. See, these guys are a little bit older, so we know. Uh, back in the uh, probably 90s, maybe 80s, yeah, there, were, there was a very famous commercial about ring around the collar. Whisk was the first liquid <coughs> detergent, okay? Major technical innovation to, to develop this. And its own, uh, Whisk was owned and developed by Unilever, by the way. Unilever is a very big and very <coughs> successful company. Uh, very heavily into R&D, real R&D, still today. Anyway, Whisk was truly a great innovation. And the fact that it was liquid meant you could pour it and you could apply it to the collar of a shirt, scrub it with a toothbrush, and voila, ring around the collar goes away. Powdered detergents can't do that. Okay, so this was a major innovation. Okay, so Whisk just took off like a rocket. P&G didn't have a liquid detergent, so they had to scramble and develop one, which they did. Anyway, Whisk no longer exists. It was sold to Sun Products in 2008, and it was discontinued a few months ago, replaced by a product called Persil. Uh, Sun Products makes that. Unilever literally lost the business to P&G. They had the technological innovation. They were way ahead. They had great marketing. All the right bells and whistles. Should have been a great success. Should have been a lasting success. P&G took it away based on their supply chain. They could not match uh, the delivery and cost benefits that P&G was able to deliver. And they lost the business. So there's, a, there's an example of, of innovation, but it's not product innovation, okay? It's supply chain innovation. But that innovation allowed P&G to literally destroy their competitor, not just beat them. They wiped them completely out. All right, let's switch gears a bit and talk about levels of innovation. There's many different levels of innovation. Uh, of course, we want to be at the highest level, but it depends on the situation, okay? So I'm going to use an example here of the camera obscura, okay? It's the original camera. It's a box with a pinhole in it, and typically ground glass or paper on the back so that the image would project onto the paper or ground glass, and you could see it, okay? No film, okay? Not, this was not a photograph, you could see it. Uh, a lot of the uh, Dutch masters, I think, used this technique to get the perspective perfect in their, in their paintings. Uh, but anyway, that's where it all started. Well, a simple innovation is to add a lens. Okay, what a lens does is it captures more light so the image is brighter and better. Okay, that's an important <coughs> innovation. I call hyper-innovation, which is going further Somebody added a second lens and made it movable. Uh, what does that do? It allows you to focus the image so it can be at different distances from the camera and you can still focus it. That's quite a nice innovation. Talk about discovery. You know, a lot of things exist in the world. We're not aware of them, but when we find them, they're useful. So silver halide, for example, crystals, when exposed to light, turn black. Somebody smart somebody, looked at that and said, hmm, I wonder what we can do with that. And realized if you ground those crystals really fine and then made a coating of them, you could use it to create a photograph. And that's what happened. So the invention now was to take that observation, that discovery, and embed it in a film on paper, use sodium thiosulfate to remove the unexposed crystals, and you got an image. Talbot did that in 1840 in France. Okay, some of the first photographs that we have in existence were made by him. Well, the exponential innovation didn't happen until George Eastman came along in 1889, and he found a way to take those finely ground silver halide crystals and embed them in gelatin, okay? And then coat them onto a plastic film, which was flexible, was easy to handle, that was exponential innovation. So he took a discovery, took some inventions, applied new technology, and innovated it. 
and came up with something that was far beyond what anybody else had. Eastman Kodak owned the film industry basically in the world until Fuji uh, uh, you know, came along in probably the 90s. So it was a very long running uh, uh, business success. Of course, it's now gone based on digital, but that's, that's life. Again, innovation replaces. Some observations on innovation. We often fail to appreciate the technology that is involved in an innovation. And I use an example, a pencil. <coughs> Milton Friedman once said that there is no person on the planet who knows how to make a pencil. Think about that for a minute. There's nobody on this planet who knows how to make a pencil. Nobody. There's a person who knows how to make the paint, another one who knows how to make the rubber eraser, Another one who knows what kind of trees and how to cut them to make the wood. Another one who knows how to make the lead that goes inside and so on and so on, okay? But there's no single individual who knows how to do all those things. So something as silly and, and, you know, and, and, uh, and simple as a, uh, as a pencil is actually quite a combination of technology and we don't even think about it. But think about sewing needles or drinking glasses or eyeglasses or any of those. How many of those do you appreciate or know how they're made. If I took you, I, I tell people, I, I'm gonna take you, you're a very smart person. I'm gonna take you and give you all the money you want. I'm gonna stick you in a warehouse, give you all the ingredients, anything you want. You want a computer? You got a computer. Anything you want, you got it. Go ahead and make concrete. You can't do it because you don't understand the technology. So it's important to understand the technology if we're going to innovate. So let's talk about weak versus strong, okay? Weak, unfortunately, is what most people are practicing today. And it's not gonna get you very far, although a lot of people think it's great. Weak innovation is undirected, it's random. It's a black box. We take 10 smart people, we stick them in a room, we slide pizza under the door occasionally, and we lock the door and say, don't come out until you have solved this problem or made this innovation. Well, guess what? If you do that and you have 10 smart people in a room, after some period of time, they are gonna come up with an innovation or two or three. Will it be the innovation that your business needs? Mm, maybe not. Maybe it'll be something different and they're not gonna learn a whole lot. And it might be easy to copy. Well, that's not gonna help us out. We want strong innovation. And strong innovation is directed by a vision. And a vision is an aspirational state or achievement that we wanna, we wanna make. It's aspirational, uh, it's not random. We have a pretty good idea where we wanna go. So I'll give you an example. Your business, for some reason, you're in Hoboken and it needs to go to California to be successful, okay? We have to, we have to go on a journey here. So you take your team and say, guys, how are we gonna get to, to uh, California? We gotta get to California. That's, that's what we need. That's what management is telling you. Okay, go innovate and figure out how we're gonna get this business to California. All right, you go in your room, lock the door, eat your pizza, and uh, you come up with your innovation. And guess what? You end up in uh, Budapest. Well, Budapest is a really nice place to be, but it's not California. And if your business needs to be in California, then you failed. That's the bottom line. Management's gonna look at this and say, well, that's very nice, but it's useless. And think about this. How many times have a bright group of people left a company and started their own company and became a big success? In some cases, billionaires, right? They had a good innovation. There's only one problem. The business where they created the innovation didn't appreciate it, didn't want it, and wasn't going to fund it. It was a failure to them. So that's not the kind of innovation we want. We want innovation that allows us to go beyond the state of the art, okay? If you're not going beyond the state of the art, then it's gonna be really easy to copy, and we don't want that. So we want an organized process, goal-oriented, now that doesn't mean so structured that you can't be creative. It just means that you have a goal in mind. We need to go to California. 
How are we going to get there? You can go through Texas, you can go through Canada, you can fly around the world the other way. There's a thousand million infinite ways to get there, but that's what we want to get. And the beauty of it is, you happen to go in the wrong direction, you end up in Texas. Well, Texas is closer to California than Hoboken. Hmm. All right, but it's still not quite where we want to be. Let's change course and go this way. That's the benefit of a vision. You always know how to make decisions. You always know what direction to go in. You want to develop innovation as a strategic capability of your business. What that means is you are so good at it that your competition's gonna have a hard time catching up or doing what you do. So think about that for a little bit. Innovation is also the ultimate form of learning because you're gonna learn something that you're not gonna find on the internet or in a book because you're gonna go beyond the state of the art. Makes it very difficult to copy and that's a great thing. So, here's some practical hints about how to do strong innovation. One of them is you want to change at least four elements of that product or service. Why four? Well, if you change one, any smart person can look at it and say, I know what they did, and reverse engineer it and copy it. Change two things. Well, again, a pretty smart person who thinks about it can do it change three things, an expert in the field can look at it and figure it out and reverse engineer it. Change four things, even an expert's gonna have a really hard time, especially if one of those four, thing, four things is a te technology that they're not aware of. So you want to change multiple things, don't just change one. And I can give you examples in the baking industry and others where people have developed products like uh, the Thomas's English Muffin, for example. I worked on that for many years, okay? It's a secret. We protect it as a trade secret. It's really not so different from bread and rolls, but it is different. And there are, I can tell you there are at least four things different in the process and, and the formula that will make it extremely difficult for anyone to figure it out. And that's a good place to be because there's an example of a business that's been in, in existence for 140 years now and no one's been able to copy it. So how do we develop our ability to innovate and make it a strategic capability of our company or our careers? I love Dr. Russell Ackoff's learning model. I don't know if he's, he's in operations, uh, well he's passed away now, but anyway, he was at uh, UPenn and uh, he wrote a whole bunch of books on uh, operations research. And uh, if you get really, uh, you need something to help you go to sleep, uh, they're great books to read, uh, very boring. Uh, but there are some insights in them that are absolutely you know, diamonds. And this is one of them, okay? He describes learning as a process that starts with data. Data are measurements or observations, okay? We take those measurements and observations and we analyze them, try and figure out what's good and bad. We look for patterns, we look for trends, okay? And when we find them, we learn something. And we call those learnings facts. Unfortunately, I'm not talking bad about Stevens, but most schools and books teach you facts, okay? They don't teach you or show you the data behind the fact. It's assumed that it's right. Well, the problem with that model is if the data changes and the world is changing and data is changing, then the fact is no longer true. So a lot of the things that we take as fact actually are not true because the data has changed, the world has changed. But anyway, it's very important to go get data, make observations, ask questions, and understand the data. Develop your information. Now take that information and put it together. Integrate it together. And what do you create? You create knowledge. That's a higher level. Take knowledge from multiple fields, multiple, multiple areas of expertise. Put them together, build a model. And what do you create? You create understanding. Again, a higher level. Understanding is where experts live. Understanding allows you to predict what will happen in areas that you haven't even experienced. You can extrapolate 
using understanding. Very powerful. Allows you to go beyond the state of the art. That's why it's so important. And the highest level is wisdom. Well, wisdom is tough to, to develop. Uh, it's a very personal thing. Uh, some people have it, some people don't. Uh, it can be gained by hard work. Uh, and I invite you, please, to, uh, to do that. Try to become wise. But uh, become experts. Whatever you do, whatever field you go into, whatever job you do, learn everything you can about it and strive to become an expert in it. Very important. So that's his model, and it's a great model. So we want to develop our ability to innovate. How do we do that? Well, the first is awareness. It's an ability or uh, a skill at identifying problems. I invite you to try this sometime. Write down today, every time you come across a problem, teach yourself to recognize problems. Why is this important? Because if you don't have this skill, then you just go on doing what you always have done. And it's okay, that's the way we do it. It's not a problem. Well, maybe it is a problem. You know, Henry Ford said if, if he had listened to consumers, uh, he would have given them a horse that went 20 miles an hour instead of 10. That's innovation. That's what consumers wanted. Well, he didn't give them that. You need a vision. A vision is an aspiration. It's what we want to achieve. Could be a year from now, could be three years from now, could be 10 years from now. The time frame is relative. The point is we have a vision or an idea where we want to go to. Makes a huge difference in your life, makes a huge difference in your company. A vision is the, the best way to motivate a group of people towards a common goal. Because if people understand the vision, now they can change and modify their behavior to go towards the vision. If everyone is moving towards the vision, we're moving in alignment. And we don't even have to talk to each other. We don't have to plan it. It's going to happen because we're all going that way. Very powerful. And I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you is that we need this in our innovation program as well. And I think this is one of the reasons why innovation has not been as successful as companies want it to be is because there is no vision. It's a random process, not directed, not goal-oriented. We need to be goal-oriented. You gotta define the problem, you gotta check out the existing paradigms, what do we know or what, what is known, what's been done, collect some data, analyze it, create some information and facts, ask lots of stupid questions. I like to tell people there are no stupid questions only stupid answers. Ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Theorize and predict, hypothesize. That's what's going to get us beyond the state of the art. And synthesize all that information together, all those facts, all that knowledge, and that's how you create understanding. Ultimately, you build a model. Model is a simple version of reality, okay? It'll never uh, include or encompass all the complexity of the real world. But the advantage of a model is that it is simple, easy to communicate, easy to understand, easy to think about, and it allows you to go beyond the state of the art. Optimization techniques. There's a whole study of optimization, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but this is uh, a branch of statistics and operations research that most people don't even think about. Uh, I like to tell people that we, we need to change the name on the door. We call ourselves research. We're not research, we're search. Because when we find something that works, we implement it. Research means you look for the best solution, not the first. So you find a solution, very nice, excellent, good job. How do you make it better? Is it the best? Can we do better? You have to ask those questions. I like to talk about incremental possibility. You know, we say, uh, uh, you know, uh, something is impossible. Can't do that. Well, that's true. It's impossible with the level of understanding and technology that we have today. But think of it this way. What, I'm, what I need to do today is climb this hill. Okay, there's a hill right here. It's a technological hill. I can see it. I can measure it. I need to climb it. 
when I get to the top of that hill and I look over into the, into the uh, landscape, what am I going to see? More hills. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next hill, climb that one. When I get to the top of that one, what am I going to see? More hills. I couldn't see those hills before because they were hidden by the one I was on. That's incremental possibility. So that's how we go from a transistor invented in 1954 that was that big to one that's now measured in nanometers. Do you think those people had any vision or any clue that that was possible at that time? No, it wasn't possible. It was impossible to go from a unit that was three inches in diameter to one that's eight nanometers. We didn't get there by one jump. We went there by climbing hills, hill after hill after hill after hill. And when you finally get to this hill, you look and go say, ah, we can do that. It was impossible before, no longer. So these are some of the techniques I was referring to. And some of the weak techniques include brainstorming. Okay, get a bunch of smart people in a room and let's brainstorm. Come up with all the ideas we can think of. It's a great technique, very popular and not very good. Why? Because there will not be a single idea on those boards that wasn't already in somebody's head in that room. That's not a bad thing because you have 10 smart people. There are going to be some good ideas up there and we may be able to combine them or uh, build on them. It's not a bad process. It's just not a good process. It's a weak process. Uh, industry loves to use five whys. It's a great program and it's actually really hard to do right. Uh, someday I hope you have a chance or if you haven't already. Try it sometime. Look at a problem and ask why five times. It's really hard to do. But if you can do it well, it's a very powerful technique. But again, it's not going to teach you anything you already don't know. And fishbone, same thing. It just helps analyze and break the problem up in pieces, which is a good thing to do. Not enough. We want some strong techniques. Kemp Trigo is and, and Tris are two uh, highly disciplined, ordered processes for problem solving. They're very structured, as good and bad. Personally, I don't like them because for me, they're too structured. However, in some problems, some complex situations, you need structure because you've got to make sure you don't miss something. And these techniques will help you do that. Experimental design, uh, yeah, theorize, hypothesize, and then go test it. And be careful how you design your experiments. Make sure you do it right and you analyze it correctly. Uh, a lot of problems in experimental design, very easy to misapply. Simplex is a hill climbing routine. I invite you to learn about it. <coughs> uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very powerful and it allows you to climb any technological hill. If you can measure something, you can optimize it. It's very interesting. But the most important part of a strong technique is that it is vision directed. We have a goal. We know where we're going to go. So identify the problem, define the vision, describe the vision, develop the strategy. Strategy is how we're going to do it, Okay, how we're going to achieve the vision. It's not what, it's how. Goals are the what. Assign tactics which means break that big ugly goal up into little pieces and assign them to individuals, give them responsibility and resources and time and get it done. And then make innovation part of the culture and the strategic capability of the company. Some of the benefits. Well, with a directed process with specific defined end results, you're going to get someplace. And I love Lily Tomlin. Lily Tomlin says, uh, uh, I always wanted to be somebody, but now I realize I should have been more specific. I don't know if everybody knows who Lily, Tom Lily Tomlin is or was, but uh, anyway, uh, she's an actress and uh, uh, developed a character that kind of defined her for the rest of her career. Uh, she became somebody, but not the somebody she wanted to be. Why? Because she didn't have a vision to, to direct her. So, that's one benefit. The other is it's not a random process. It's goal oriented. We're going to get someplace. You know, uh, in uh, Alice in Wonderland, Alice asked the cat for help, the Cheshire cat. 
I'm lost, can you please help me? And the cat says, sure, where do you wanna go? And she goes, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. I wanna get someplace. And the cat says, well, then any road will do. If you walk long enough, you will get someplace. It may not be the place you wanna be, but you will get someplace. That's not the kind of innovation we want. We want to get someplace where we want to be. Uh, vision directed is transparent. It's adaptable, it's responsive, goal-oriented. We can use many different techniques and coordinates our team efforts so we achieve the vision. And most important, we create a strategic capability that our competitors cannot easily copy. So to summarize, vision directed, the aspirational state, very important. We want to put our competitors in the rear view mirror. That's what we want. That's the best place for them. We have a strategic plan so we know how we're going to do it. We have goals. We know what steps we need to take to achieve it. And we can break those goals up into tactics, assign them, and get them done in real time. The change is purpose driven. It's intentional. It's multi-level, not simple. And we've made it on purpose difficult to copy. We've built a moat around it. And it's a process, okay? It's not an accident, it's not luck. We actually did this on purpose. We did it for a reason. Two most important factors in the success of any organization or business are leadership and innovation. And when you put those two together, you get innovation for success. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, two questions. I'll, I'll start off with the slide on books. Six thinking hats. I'm wondering something from 1985 and then another one from 1999. I've always found business books to um, be insightful, but in a lot of ways also being a product of their time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the youngest person in the room, I'm not the oldest person in the room, but I've found myself in, in time trying to figure out how things are going to move. It's not always the same, like you mentioned, change. How is something from 1985 or is, are those six thinking hats, how is that um, applicable for the 21st century? It's a great question, and uh, uh, I think the techniques in that book are timeless. Uh, they're gonna be just as relevant in, a, in 100 years or 1,000 years as they are today. One of the big risks with any team, uh, innovation team or other, uh, is group think, uh, or you get one person who's louder than the others and they tend to dominate. Uh, but groupthink is a real risk. What I advise people is that every coin has two sides, meaning, oh, we have an idea. It's a great idea. It's a wonderful idea. Look at all these benefits. We can do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, it's great. Okay, so that's great, excellent. Turn the coin over and tell me what's bad about this idea. And that often shocks people because they go, well, wait a second, this is a good idea. It's not, there is no bad. So, ah, I think you need to think about it and check it out a little bit because what you'll find is that in good, there's always a little bad. And in bad, there's always a little good. So we have to be open-minded to that. And what the Six Thinking Hats uh, talks about, that book, what Edward, Edward de Bono brings out, is it says you create a team with at least six people on the team and you give each of them a different colored hat. So one gets a green hat, one gets a white hat, one gets a black hat, one gets a red hat. And along with that hat comes a, a responsibility to take a, a particular perspective on the problem. So the one with the green hat, their job is to find all the good things about this idea and be a strong proponent for, for what's good about this idea. The guy gets the black hat, his job is to find everything wrong with the idea. His job is to be the critic. Find everything wrong with it, try to knock it down, try and kill it, and so on. One has to deal with timing and, and planning, another one with money, 
uh, you know, sort of six different roles that these people on the team now have to, have to play. And play is an important word because they do play. It's a role that they play. And playing makes it fun. And, you know, we, people love to compete. We love to play games. And when you make it a game, it becomes fun. And we actually work even harder at it because we want to win. Everybody wants to win. Nobody wants to lose. So when you give people six different colored hats and give them six different roles, they will actually play them pretty tough. And depending on the problem or the, or the solution that you've come up with, uh, maybe it is a really good solution and maybe there are some bad elements to it or some bad consequences possible. We need to know that up front. Why? Maybe we can fix them. Maybe we can at least be aware of them and handle them or prepare for them in case they happen. So I think that book is, uh, and the thinking behind it is actually timeless and uh, uh, it's applicable to teams uh, anytime, anywhere. And uh, Russell Ackhoff as well, his, his stories are, uh, uh, like I say, a little boring, but, uh, but his thinking is, is crystal clear and very insightful. And again, I think his, his thinking is, is timeless. Uh, I, I, I wrote a book recently on leadership that's going to be published in a, in a few months, I hope, uh, and I did a bunch of research on it. There are books on leadership written, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. Uh, one of the most famous is by Marcus Aurelius, who, had, who became Caesar. Uh, he wrote a book called Meditations. You want to read an interesting book on leadership? Read his book. You can still buy it today. Uh, you know, these thoughts, these concepts, are re really are timeless. Uh, so they don't, they don't go bad. They're, they're not like milk. <laughs> Any other questions? Remember, there's no bad questions. Um, Len, in your experience, how do you optimize, uh, how do you instill innovation in an organization, either, let's say, from a college curriculum where uh, you're preparing innovators for the real world, or perhaps in a business as well. But how do you do that? It's nice to see the slides, but in your practice, how do you get people to, to, uh, you know, to really overcome their risk aversion? Uh, you do it like almost anything else, and that's with leadership. You have to have uh, a leadership. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be the CEO. Okay, it can be a manager or, or a, di a director in a company. Uh, but somebody needs to step out in front of it and take the lead and then be a champion for the innovation or a champion to solve the problem. Uh, champion means somebody who keeps pushing and pushing and pushing to f and, and keeps finding ways. Uh, as I said before, innovation is risky. Uh, there's lots of problems and there are lots of people in, in the world today uh, who will do everything possible to find only the bad in your idea and help knock it down and stop it. Why? Well, it wasn't their idea, for starters. It was yours. Uh, and uh, maybe they had another idea they, they would prefer to see uh, go forward. Uh, but anyway, innovation and change are risky, so you have to recognize that uh, and be real about it. Uh, do what you can to identify the potential risks and what we can do to manage them and control them and minimize them. Uh, and then put a, put a process in place to, uh, uh, to get it done. Uh, it, it takes leadership. So my question was, you had specific companies selected as the role models, yep. if you wish, for the um, characteristics that were desirable, right. all right? So how did you arrive at those companies? Because what I did not see on the list were the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Apples, the, you know. Um, well, Apple was, on, was top of the list. Oh, that's true, Apple was. Uh, well, I couldn't put every company up there. Uh, and all I, what I did was I picked the companies I thought that had such a clear c competitive advantage in those areas that you know, there was nobody else even close. Uh, certainly Amazon has a number of competitive advantages. Uh, but uh, they haven't developed their supply chain quite as effectively as P&G. Uh, 
Uh, they don't have brands, really, except Amazon, which is a great brand, but they don't have brands beyond that, so they're not like Nestle. Uh, uh, they don't develop, well, they are developing products, and they're pretty good products, too, but, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you think of design, uh, you know, Apple has really done a great job of, of, of you know, championing that as a competitive advantage, and, and, and they've, uh, you know, taken the world by storm because of that, and over a fairly long period of time now, in, in the electronics industry, it's unusual for somebody to stay top of the heap for more than five years. I mean, look at Nokia, look at Qualcomm, look at, uh, you know, keep going. Uh, so many of these companies, uh, Motorola, uh, used to own the cell phone business. Today, they don't even sell a cell phone. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing, you know, uh, change in, 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 uh, in, in, in the, the competitive environment. You, you, you have to keep ahead. And if you let yourself rest even a little bit on your success, somebody's going to come take it away. And that's what happened, I think, to Motorola. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the, in one of the slides, you say that find a way to do something that no one is doing. So how, like, don't you think it is very tough to find out that something, like if I have an idea, definitely across the globe, somebody would be working on something, same sort of that. So would that affect my innovation or my idea? Ah, okay. The question is, uh, you know, I come up with, with a great idea, but chances are there's somebody else on the planet some other company working on a similar idea. Should I be concerned about that? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, be concerned. Uh, do some homework. Uh, see if you can find out uh, what other people are doing or have done. You don't want to uh, develop something new only to find out that somebody's already done it. That's not a great use of your time and, and resources. So you want to do a little uh, digging and learn what your competitors are doing. Uh, no, because uh, uh, if you're truly doing innovation correctly, meaning you truly are creating a new idea or new technology and creating multiple levels of, of change in your product, the likelihood that somebody else is going to develop the exact same thing as you is pretty low. Pretty low. But it will come after a time. It will not come initially. It will come after a particular period of time, after one year or two years. But initially, if we think uh, somebody else is doing so, we just think that then we would try to work on this idea. Well, eventually somebody's going to copy uh, what you did and maybe even find a better way to do it. So that's why I say you can't wait to innovate the next time. Once you come out with something, you already have to be working on your, your next level. And it can't be just evolutionary. In other words, a little change here, a little change there. Uh, that's nice, but it's not enough. It really needs to be evolutionary. You need to jump to another level. And when you jump to that another level, the others, will, they won't be able to keep up with you. They won't be able to catch up. So that's what's really cool about like P&G as an example with the supply chain. I said their supply chain is the best in the world, and it is. If you're a small company, okay, you should be thinking about how you're going to catch up to P&G. Okay, and you should be thinking in three years, our vision is to have a supply chain as good as P&G, right? Okay, you're gonna do that. That's a good thing to do. Here's the problem. When you get there three years from now and you were greatly successful, you caught up to P&G, you got there. By that time, they've already gone to another level. They're not gonna be sitting where they are today, three years from now. They're going to be investing the profits that they make in making their system even better and faster. So in three years, they're, they're already out here. So another story from Alice in Wonderland. When, the, uh, when you're running, uh, Alice is running with the queen, right? And the queen says, well, if you want to stay where you are, you have to run as fast as you can. And if you want to go someplace, you have to run even faster. That's a fact. That's, that's the way innovation is. So if you want to stay where you are, you better be running as fast as you can and keep the competitors in your rearview mirror. Yeah, but that's live too, right? I mean, you mentioned Kodak before. So that's an interesting example. I mean, it's, it's prescient in my mind because that only happened, I mean, that went belly up, what, seven years ago, something like that? I mean, there's a famous conversation I read about where 
just add to you know what you were saying before. Uh, they hired print guys as their CEO in the C level suite. Somebody said, hey, we could either do digital or we could do print. And there was a famous conversation where the CEO with all his guys around the table said, I know one thing, I know print, we're doing we're doing that. And and the rest is history. And you know, that entire city is dead because of because of it. There's like I forget how many acres and acres of like processing plants there now. Um, but it's it's an amazing thing. That's that's life. That's the life cycle of a company. Maybe it's shortened, but like you said, it's vicious, it's fast, it's mean. So uh, move. An another really simple example uh, is the beverage industry. When they first came out with uh, diet sodas, uh, they made a lot of money on Coke made, and Pepsi made a lot of money on their on their soda, okay, and their beverages. They assigned a group to develop the low calorie or uh, diet products. Initially, they were small selling and expensive to make and distribute. And uh, they were cannibalizing the other brand. They made less money at that time on the diet products than they did on their regular. So if you're top management in Coca-Cola, your job was to kill that diet product because it's taking away profit from the company. Okay, but that's a very short-sighted view because they either they were smart enough or, or whatever, but 20 years later, today, those diet products now are becoming the majority of the business and that's where they make a lot of their money. It flipped. But initially, that wasn't the case and they wanted to kill those things. Same thing happened with uh, uh, light beer. Um, yeah, they wanted the the, the, uh, the management in place wanted to kill those products because they were they were reducing the profitability of the company. But anyway, if you take away one thing today, please, the combination of leadership and innovation, applying good leadership to innovation. In other words, not allowing innovation to be a random process. It needs leadership. It needs a vision. It needs a goal. If you can do that. You can, you can innovate and have some success. Otherwise, you won't. So take, just take that away. Innovation requires leadership. Thank you. Thank you.